Okay, thank you very much. Um, while I just check something here. First of all, thank you to the translators. They're doing a brilliant job. Fantastic job there. Thank you very much. I think. Um, okay, I'm going to talk to you about how to create La Dolce Vita, which is Italian for the good life, good things, a good work environment across physical and mental barriers. And I've been listening to the previous speakers, very interesting talks. I already agree with a lot that's been said. A little bit about me. <clears throat> this is a real name. Many people wonder if it's a real name. It really is my name. Pellegrino Riccardi is my name. My parents are from Italy. They come from Napoli. Whoops, just got this here. Um, have you heard of Napoli? What is Napoli famous for? Mafia, thank you. All right. But it's important to be honest and say what you're actually thinking. Uh, they left Napoli in 1960 and moved to the UK, so I was raised in the UK, which is why I speak English like this. And I now live in Norway. I've been there for just over 20 years, which means I can be three nationalities when I want to. I can pick which nationality I can be. And I like to play with people. <clears throat> I'm a people observer, and, and a game I play is to say these words to people in different accents. Because when I say you can trust me with a British accent, it works quite well. I work for myself. I have to speak to the tax authorities in Norway. I do speak Norwegian, but I only speak English with them. Of course I do. You can trust me. I pay all my taxes. I also can do it with a Norwegian accent. I was asked once at an airport by a very nice gentleman if I could just watch his bags. I answered in a Norwegian accent. You can trust me. I'm from Norway. He said, are you Norwegian? I'm Norwegian. He said to me, Norwegians are lovely people. I said, yes, we are. You can trust all of us. But the one that doesn't work very well is the last one. Now, you've already started laughing. I haven't said anything yet, which is an interesting concept, isn't it? Why have you already started laughing? Because you already know what it sounds like. You can trust me, right? <laughs> Imagine speaking to the tax authorities with that accent. You can trust me. I pay all of my taxes. And I'd like to explain what's going on in your brain because collaboration and cooperation, you, the, the biggest barrier is your brain. You see, the brain has images in your head. We go around with these fixed images in our head. Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not so good. But the brain likes to see familiar things. For example, you go into a building and you have to stand in line. Do you understand how the system works? Of course you do. You've seen this image before. You're familiar with it. You're comfortable. You go into another building and you have to stand in line. Do you understand how to use the system? Yes, you do. You've seen this before. You, it's an image in your head. You're comfortable with it. Two images you've seen before. No problem. No stress. Then you go into a third building and they use a slightly different system. And already we're laughing, right? But this system is used by hundreds of millions of people in Asia. You've got three different ways to do the same thing. And when we talk about change and we talk about diversity, really, it's all, it, all it is is, are you open to new images or are you closed? Do you think it's interesting or do you think it's ridiculous? So the brain can be your worst enemy. Because one thing about the brain is that our brains are hardwired to look for the negative before the positive. That's how the brain works, right? Um, there's a very good explanation for this. If we go back in time, 20,000 years, when we're all roaming around the forests and the caves, it was much more important to see all the dangerous things out there before the positive. Then you lived longer. Makes sense, right? The brain still works in the same way. I mean, imagine you're going along, you're driving along in the snow one evening, and you see something on the road, and you think, what is that? I wonder what that is. I wonder what that can be. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> what? And what happens? <laughs> I know, it's the last time now, okay? <laughs> if you see something dangerous enough times, that makes a print in your brain. And now all you can see is danger. Yes, that's all you can see, right? And when you're seeing the danger, you're only focusing on the danger, you can't actually see what's next to it. And perhaps next to the danger is something like this, where a guy is holding a golden ticket for you. And that's how the brain works against you. We get so used to seeing dangers that we don't see the positives. By the way, this is the strategy of Donald Trump. Same thing, right? So 
you have to recognize that it's negative first. We're really good at seeing problems. I do it too. In 1995, I met a Norwegian woman. She came to England for a couple of years, but after two years, she said, I would like to move back to Norway. Now, I now have an opportunity to move to the richest country in the world. You would think I would jump at this opportunity. I would love to collaborate with my wife and set up a new life in Norway. But I was quite negative, actually, because the brain sees problems. That's what we do. She tried to convince me, but I just wasn't buying it. We were on holiday in Italy, on a beautiful beach in Italy, and she said to me, she had the nerve to say to me, you know, we have beaches in Norway too. <laughs> and the image that pops up in my head is what? Right? Something like this. <laughs> Why would I change that for that? Right? I'm on a beach in Italy. But then I say to you, is this a beach in Italy? It could be a beach anyway, but actually this is a beach in Norway. And there are thousands of beaches that look like this all over Norway. And the point about this little story is that it's so important to challenge the images in your head. Because the images in your head can be your biggest barrier. And people who deal with change today, they're not people who know what's in the future. They're people with certain attitudes. And it's already been mentioned, basically. They're open, they're curious, but most importantly, they are brave. Why are they brave? Because they jump into situations where there are new images where they don't know the result. You've got to be brave today, especially today because the world is changing and it's changing really fast. You know this. You've heard this before. I'd like you to feel it. I'm going to show you how fast the world is changing. Put your hand up if you remember what this was. Right? Everybody remembers a VHS video cassette. Does anyone remember what this part of the cassette was? That little part there. It, that was to protect the recording. You took out the plastic piece. Yeah, people know, oh yeah, I remember. You took that out and it was protected. And if you changed your mind, then you had to tape over the hole. Do you remember this? We used to call this technology. Yes. The last film that was released in this format was this film here. You recognize the actor on the front because it wasn't very long ago. The year was 2006. 2006 you could still buy VHS films. And then you think, really? Are you sure it wasn't 1986? I'm sure. 2006. 13 years. 13 years is nothing. So when this website comes out with its first version, it has an age limit, a minimum age of 18. This is not going to work because a 13-year-old just writes, 18, I am not a robot, is in. But version 2 works much better where they ask the question, what is the image below? <laughs> and here you get a very, very different response, right? So, and it's, and it's today's world, it's about staying in touch because it's going so far. You don't have time to think about how much better it was before or how safe it is now. You've got to go with it. You don't have time to wait. What happens if you don't stay up with developments? This woman has been away from work for 13 years. She comes back to work. She hasn't followed the technological advancements. This is what happens if you don't keep up. Okay, so. And when I show this film, all the old people, people over 40 laugh. But people under 30 don't even know why it's funny. That's how fast it's going. And one thing I can promise you, everybody, I don't know what the future looks like, but I can promise you one thing, anything is possible, okay? Anything is possible. One thing you cannot do with change today is basically this. You can't put your head in the sand anymore. You can't pretend it's not there. It is there. And what happens if you do this? I'm going to show you what happens if you do this. This is what happens, right? So change is about jumping in. It's being brave enough to jump in and do things that are scary. And so you have the diversity part, okay? Now, I moved to Norway 20 years ago, and I had to, I had to, become, uh, I had to learn new habits. I had to learn new ways of looking at life, things that I had never thought about. For example, rules. Uh, Norwegians are quite good at following rules. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how Latvians are. I usually look at the taxi drivers. They usually tell you how much they like rules. I parked my car in Oslo one day like this. Now, <clears throat> in the south of Italy, this is fine. 
But my wife said to me, you can't park like that. Why not, I asked. She said, because you're on the line. What do you mean I'm on the line? She says, your wheel must be inside the box. Are you kidding me? Nope, she says. You need to be able to put your finger between the rubber tire and the line, then you're safe. I said to her, what about the butt of the car? The, the butt of the car can be outside the box, but the wheel must be inside the box. So according to her rules, 90% of my car is legal. That must be good enough. Was it good enough? Well, of course it wasn't. There's my parking fine. And when I ask my fellow Norwegians if they feel sorry for me, you get no sympathy. In the south of Italy, it's a little different. We were on holiday in this beautiful park. My family comes from a place just over the hills there. My wife is complaining that there's no system. How do you know where to park? I said, well, there is no system. The way we fix things here is by relationships and networking. I said to her, I need to find someone who can help us. And then it's my job to get a relationship with that person in as short a possible time as possible. Because if they like you in Italy, they will help you. So I said to her, wait here, she can help us. I go over to her. I happen to speak Napoletano, the dialect of Naples. That's a useful start. I ask if there's any parking. She doesn't answer my question. She says, where are you from? I tell her where I'm from. She says, you speak Napoletano. Well, I explain why I speak Napoletano. She said, where did you learn? I learned from my father and my mother. Where are they from? I say, they come from a little village called Forino. She says to me, Forino, I am from Forino. Fantastic. This is a good start. And after three, four minutes of smiling and laughing and charming her pants off, because that's what Italians do, yeah? That's why Italians do all this. It's a survival mechanism. She says to me, what was your question? I said, I'm looking for parking, public parking. She says, we have a public parking, but don't park your car there. Why not? It's too expensive. Now she's my personal advisor. Wow, that's a lot of money. What should I do? She says, today is your lucky day. I like you very much. I will help you. Park your car over there. Where? And she points to a sign. It says private parking. It's in front of a shop. I say, listen, it's private parking in front of a shop. She says, I know. As you can see, the shop is closed because the owner is not here today. He is on holiday. I know him very well. It's okay to park. No problem. You can trust me, she says. <laughs> I'm not so sure. Then she gets a little bit angry with me. She says, all right, you do what you like. If you don't want my help, it's okay. Park your car, spend 40 euro. Because if you had parked your car there, I give you 30 euro, fine. You save yourself 10 euro, right? <laughs> now, two different ways to do the same thing. I haven't got time to discuss which one is better. In fact, it's not interesting which one is better. But I challenge you to look at the one which is usually not better, this one. I challenge you to see good things in that culture. Because I know what we Italians are not good at. But do you know what we are good at? And then you can turn it around and I say, well, I know what Norwegians are good at, where I live. But do the Norwegians know what they're not good at? And here's the best part. How about combining the two together? and taking the best of both worlds. Because diversity pays, it really does. The research coming back is showing us more and more that diversity pays. When you manage diversity, you're making better decisions. But you've got to be brave enough to jump out in there and do it. Richard Florida's research says a lot, his famous experiment, he asked two groups of people to solve a simple puzzle. And one group of people look like this, white men be between 40 and 50 with the same kind of economics background. The other group was very diverse. And then they were asked to solve the problem. And of course, the diverse group on average solved the problem in about 90 seconds because it's not that difficult. The other group, the, the, the homogenous group, took as long as 10 minutes. Why? Because when that approach is not appropriate for the problem, you get a bit stuck. Whereas in the diverse teams, you're getting more and more options and perspectives. That's why it's important to collaborate, especially with people who aren't like you. Any fans of soccer here know that France was the last team to win the World Cup. 
the most diverse football team ever to win a World Cup. And if you want more proof of how bad it can be when it's homogenous, look no further, all right? Now we know why it's called the White House, all right? Yes. And I don't need research to prove. I've got my own proof. Here are my three kids. Now, I know they look really Norwegian, but every day, me and my wife are constantly trying to give them the best of the Norwegian, the best of the British, and the best of the Italian. And I can promise you that the results of this collaboration diversity project are really good. But you need to jump out in there. So I'm a big fan of diversity. But how does it work in the real world? Let's look at some unlikely collaborations out there, and there are loads of them. I haven't got time to do them all. Um, has anyone heard of Khan Academy? Khan Academy, anyone? They're basically the biggest company to provide what are known as MOOCs. Massive open online courses where you learn online. Very cheap, very efficient, very good. And thousands and thousands of people all over the world are doing these courses. They're really good. They have their limitations, but they're really good. So good, in fact, that people like Harvard University and MIT are thinking, we're struggling to get the people we want. People are doing their online courses. They're all going on about these MOOCs. So what do they do? They get together and they produce their own MOOC called edX. And here's the best part. They do it for free. They invest money and do it for free. Why? Because they're creating communities. They're going to be better than the MOOCs. They're going to offer more things. They're willing to spend money to create communities. And that's something that a man called Jack Ma did too. Jack Ma is the founder of a, of a company called Alibaba in China. He's China's richest man. So he's done quite well for himself. One company he has is called Tabao. Tabao is like Amazon in China. And when he first started this, he was trying to get Chinese people to trust a system they'd never used before. And Chinese are not exactly the most trusting people in the world. And in the end, the only way that Jack Ma could get the Chinese population to use his system was to provide the service for free. He paid for everything. I'm, you, if you're selling, you pay nothing. If you're buying, you pay nothing to me because I want to change people's mind. And at the time, eBay said, free is not a business model. That was 2003. By 2017, 65% of China's 753 million smartphone users were using mobile payments. $17 trillion, more than China's GDP. In other words, he's collaborating, he's brave, he's open, he's curious, and he's doing it for free in order to get something in the end. This is what it's all about today. Um, everybody's heard, any, any, let's make it easy. Put your hand up if you don't use Facebook. It's fine, good, well done. Do you agree with the statement, Facebook is good for your health? Put your hand up if you think that's good. Nobody, right? Wrong. The NHS in Britain, the National Health Service, is using Facebook to raise awareness around kidney donors and kidney transplants. Instead of criticizing the people who are easy to criticize, why not use them to your advantage? Why not collaborate with them and actually use them to do good things? Another really important part of collaboration. How about this one? Coca-Cola is good for your health. You would think that was rubbish, right? And yet Coca-Cola has got a huge collaboration going on with a pharmaceutical company called Sanofi. Why? Sanofi want to produce health drinks. And who better to distribute health drinks than Coca-Cola. They're working with the enemy to do good things. So instead of seeing the problems in it, you look for the positives. And even in Norway, in my home country now, we've got some brilliant collaborations going on. I think the easiest one to explain is this one here. Hurtiruten is the cruise ship that sails up the coast of Norway, stops in all the fjords. It's an amazing journey. It's got 12 days long if you do the whole thing with 34 stops. And if you're lucky enough, you get to see the northern lights. It's an amazing trip. But the point about it was Hurtiruten 10 years ago was almost bankrupt. You would think, how can a company that shows you this go bankrupt? It was almost bankrupt. So they invited a British equity company in. 
not just with money, but with ideas. And at the time, Norwegians thought this was scandalous. How can you take a national symbol and give it to the Brits? But the Brits came in and they turned a ship journey into a collaboration. How do they do that? Well, stopping at every port of call, when they stop at the port, they're getting in food and supplies from the local villages and communities. So now 34 communities are all supplying the same boat. So instead of trying to compete with the other 34 stops, you're collaborating to create one common entity. And the whole point of these examples are, collaborate when you can, compete when you have to. Collaborate when you can, compete when you have to. Because collaboration isn't as some kind of naive, open, let's just do it for fun. You have to collaborate. It's what the whole sharing economy is about. Uh, even today, actually, while I was sitting there, I used this app. Does anyone use the app Shazam? It's a music recognition app, fantastic. You hear a song, you press a button, up comes the song. I did it this morning, very nice tune. And when you've found your song, then with one click, you can either buy it or you can stream it. All on the same screen, two, three maximum clicks. These three entities are competing. They're providing for the customer what's known as a bundled offering or one common customer facing solution. Because the customers don't care who's behind it. I don't care who provides it. I just want something cool. So, how do you provide La Dolce Vita? What kind of physical barrier? Well, first of all, I'd like to, when it comes to language, I'm a little bit of a pedantic, because I studied languages. And you've got two words in English, cooperation and collaboration. And in Norwegian, there's only one word. Perhaps the same in Latvian, I'm not sure, okay? But the word is collaboration. Collaboration is working together. It comes from Latin and it means to work with others. And the important part of it is work. It doesn't come for free. It costs you. It's, it's strenuous. It's physical. So quickly, just to spend the last few minutes of my presentation, what kind of barriers and what can you do to create better environments? A man called Daniel Cole has written an excellent book called The Culture Code where he talks about relationships and collaborations. What do you need to make collaborations work? And his research, he's boiled it down to three questions. Three questions you need to be able to answer yes to in order to know that the collaboration and the relationships around you are working well. The first question is, are we safe? The second one is, are we connected? And the third one is, do we share a future together? So in order to create a successful collaboration, you need to be able to answer yes, yes, and yes. Are we safe? Do we have trust? It's already been talked about today, trust. One thing I know is you can't force people to have trust. You can't force trust on people. You have to grow it. Here are two soccer managers. I'm not going to talk about soccer. But he creates a lot of trust. He creates a lot of fear. Some of you may recognize him. I was raised in this way. I was raised by very hierarchical parents, authoritarian parents, who use this type of leadership to try to create trust. If you didn't eat my mother's food, she would use this technique to persuade you to eat the food. Here we go. It works, but it doesn't create trust. So how do we create trust? I didn't really understand what trust was until a few years ago when I, um, <clears throat> I turned 50 and I decided to buy myself a present to, for myself. It was a midlife crisis present. I'm going to buy myself a watch. Why a watch? I had never owned a watch in my life, had zero interest in watches. But why would I suddenly want a watch? Because I started noticing many men around 50 years old were wearing very nice watches. And they're very good at showing you their very nice watches, too. They usually have short arms when they're, especially at airport security, when they put the watch back on, they always take a long time, you know, just to make sure everybody gets a good look. Sorry, taking my watch here. So I'm going to have a watch. I had to Google and find out which watch. I knew nothing about watches. I'm going to buy a Rolex. I'm not going to tell you how much it costs. You can't, def you can't explain the price. It's stupid. I go into the shop. First time I have it on my arm, I have my wife with me, of course, I need approval. 
What do you think, darling? Amazing, buy it. Look at the price tag. Don't worry, go for it. You deserve it. God, it's quite heavy, isn't it? Oh, God, you don't, would you just buy the bloody thing? Suddenly, the man behind the counter, the owner of the shop, says to me, Sir, don't buy that watch. Excuse me, I say. He says, I wouldn't buy that watch. Why not, I ask. And he says to me, because. I hear this is the first time you're buying a watch. If you're going to spend so much money on your first watch, you need to be absolutely sure you want that watch. You're not. He, then he says to me, you see, when you buy your first watch, you're starting a relationship. And that's not the best way to start a relationship, sir. And then he says, just so we're sure, if you insist on swiping your MasterCard now, I am not going to stop you. I'm not your mother. But I wouldn't buy it. Let me ask you all, do you like that man behind the counter? Do you like him? He's cool, isn't he? I didn't buy the watch. I went home, I didn't buy a watch. But now I was really interested in watches. And, I, and then I googled a bit more, and the conclusion was that I would buy this watch instead. Where did I go to buy this watch? There's only one place on the planet I'm going to. And it's the same guy, right? That's trust. And what did he do to create that trust? He was honest with me. It starts with honesty. You've already talked about it. It was mentioned by my previous speaker, integrity. But he was brave. You need courage. to Trust is about courage. I'll tell you why. Because trust involves being vulnerable. It involves being vulnerable with other people. They could take advantage of you. And if, I think Latvians are quite close to Southern Italians when it comes to trusting strangers. I think you are. It's not easy for a Southern Italian to trust a stranger. It's something in our DNA. You've got to be brave. You've got to be responsive. He was responsive with me. He's following me. He's responsive. And this lovely word here, benevolence. Benevolence means that he said those things for my good. And if people believe that you're doing it for their good as well as your good, then you can have a collaboration. And these are the five behaviors of trust. Are we safe? Are we connected? Do we share a future together? We've got time for one more. Are we connected? Now, everybody wants to be connected. It's human, it's human need number one. Thing is, when you get to the Nordic Baltic countries, you've got a kind of need for space. We're quite reserved up here, and space is quite important. Our neighbors in Finland need more space than anybody on the planet. Okay? Nobody beats the Finns. This is the country that gave us Nokia, of course, connecting people. Quite ironic, that. Um, and everybody knows, standing in a line up here, you need to have a certain amount of space between you and the person in front. Everybody knows that. That distance is important, right? Uh, that distance is even more important. And what I do is, a southern, when I want to be Southern Italian, I like to play with people. If I'm standing behind somebody in Latvia, I would probably do this, just move forward a bit. Three centimeters is enough. Already that guy is feeling a little bit of stress, wondering what the hell you're doing. And it's always good to see how far can I go before I get a reaction. Sorry, you can trust me, no problem. Because traveling around the world is very different. If you go to a place like India, right? I don't know what's going on here, but the guy there doesn't look very happy. I wish I was in Latvia, yes, uh, me too. So, mind the gap. And the only way to close the gap is to be open, curious, and brave, especially the brave part. Because when you jump into a collaboration that you wouldn't normally do, you make yourself vulnerable. You need to be brave. Sure, you will get burnt sometimes, but usually you don't. Collaborate when you can. Compete when you have to. So here we are. Are we safe? Are we connected? Do we share our futures together? Those are the three questions you should be asking yourselves, and you should be able to answer yes, yes, and yes. I hope this was useful to you, a little bit inspirational. I wish you luck in your collaborations. Thank you very much.